Hi, this is Randall and welcome to session number four of the uh, COVID-19 and the Supply Chain Impact series where we are talking about for you as a small business owner, where do you position your business uh, potentially now and for the next three to five years based on where you think the money's going to flow uh, as far as you building your legacy business. And we are assessing the impact that COVID-19 has had on various supply chains. So you can assess whether or not you are currently pursuing the right market or whether you need to look at potential markets. If you stay in your market, what decisions can you start making now to help you in both the short and long term? That being the case, I'm excited to talk about this one. I actually almost led with this one, but I wanted to wait until I collected a little bit more information on this one. This one I find really fascinating. We're talking about medical products, healthcare, pharmaceutical, pharmacy, and health insurance. All right. So let's get going. By way of recap, if you recall, the supply chain is comprised of both supply side needs, which is you as a supplier, and the demand side, which is from your customer and upstream. And so when they're looking at buying goods and services, they evaluate the supply chain by all of the elements on this chart. And in this case, here is your list of um, all the companies in the uh, all of the supply chains in the Global 500. We've already covered aerospace and defense airline. Uh, we're covering healthcare, insurance and managed care, medical facilities, pharmacy and other services. Um, and we're covering medical products and equipment, pharmaceuticals and wholesalers is what we're covering in this one. And if you also recall, we talked about the value chain, which for some of you who do not provide products and services into the primary activities for the company, uh, what you offer could very well be in uh, what we consider uh, back office or support activities, in which case, what's your role in helping to drive margin and profitability for the companies? And so, again, let's just talk about <clears throat> this as an integrated uh, an integrated supply chain because one of these leads into the next, leads into the next, leads into the next. So overall, the implications for all of these, we're going to talk about them individually, but let's talk about them as a group. So individually, we see that uh, there's some potential manufacturing location repositioning. A lot of factories that have been based in China, um, a, a whole host of industries, this one specifically, are rethinking is that the best decision? It may have made a lot of sense because the low cost of labor and the infrastructure that China put in place, but in the midst of a pandemic and with COVID-19 and you have scarcity of resources and you have um, every country acting in their own national interest, which means that obligations that they may have had to other countries uh, may become second and third priority then we're looking at a potential repositioning of manufacturing locations which is going to have a it's going to be a tremendous disruption to the supply chain in and of itself nationalization of critical supplies and equipment uh in this case one of the things is we've typically had just in time shipment with small stockpiles of things but there's probably going to be a huge disruption in the supply chain as each country rethinks how what quantity first what do they deem to be critical supplies, critical medicines, critical equipment? And then secondly, how much of it do they need on hand? Uh, so um, we can anticipate that both in the short and longer term, there's going to be some some impact to the supply chain on that. Uh, purchasing pattern ships of major customers due to to uh, domestic providers. Right now, we're seeing a, a huge shift to nationalism, where to the extent that governments and other big organizations, rather than buying offshore, they may want to um, shift that purchase to domestic providers. In some cases, they may actually create domestic providers. So they keep that money in country 
just for the purpose of maintaining viability of the two items before it. All right, in order to nationalize it, in order to reposition manufacturing, most customers need, uh, most suppliers need a, a, a reliable customer. So you might see governments and other industries moving the purchase to domestic providers to make sure that they have enough volume to continue to be viable over the long term. So that's going to have a huge shift on this on the uh, supply chain. Uh, home care for aging populations. Uh, that's going to start having some impact on how products and services are delivered to this industry and to the extent that uh, we start seeing consumer-based medical technology uh, what is it that consumers are going to have access to how is that going to be manufactured how are they going to support the equipment how, how what is the business model implication for just dealing with an aging population and and in this case if care is shift from a medical facility to home what does that look like are we going to see more medical equipment needed in the house are we going to see more healthcare profession uh, professionals come to the house are we going to see uh, additional remote diagnostic based tools like the thing that you can put your thumb on and me measure your your heart rate your EKG are we going to see more and more things that are more suitable for the consumer so that the consumer can be a partner with the health professional to uh, figure out what's going on what's the technology what's the infrastructure what's the business model that's going to support all of that uh, global pricing shifts now this one I'm being very specific in this case um, a lot of the Western countries or a number of the wealthier countries have funded the research into pharmaceuticals and other products because they could afford to pay more. But we're now seeing that um, as wealthy countries or Western countries don't have as much income to continue doing that like they used to, they are looking at what we would call the most favored nations kind of thing where one country says no either you sell to us at the global average or less than average price or um, we're going to allow people within a certain country or territory to purchase outside of that market for the purpose of getting lower lower pricing now what that means is that's going to have a, a huge impact on the entire pricing model around the globe assuming research will continue to need to be funded OK, uh, so while we might see a huge decrease in pricing in the wealthier markets, we might start seeing a slight increase in pricing in um, some, some of the, the other markets. And so when you start seeing that going on, then underneath it, you still have to maintain a competitive cost structure. And in doing that, that's going to put some additional demands on your supply chain, especially if you start seeing where concurrent with the pricing shifts you have the opportunity to to uh, change where you are manufacturing how much equipment you're going to stockpile and uh, who, who's doing the purchasing so this one's going to be fascinating to see how that shakes out and then overall for this entire uh, medical care supply chain is new market entries people doing things they hadn't done before although a company like uh, walmart is not in this list because that's not their primary supply chain we heard them announce that they might consider opening um, health care facilities within their stores or doing other kinds of things that's kind of a huge thing we did see where in the united states cvs purchased um, made a bid to purchase New United Healthcare, a major insurance, a, ma a major insurance provider. So, a pharmacy purchasing an insurance provider. So, we will continue to see uh, a whole host of things going on there. Uh, in addition to that, on the list you'll see here, uh, Healthcare of America uh, beginning to open uh, urgent care centers and ambulatory. Uh, care facilities and a whole host of things so people shifting into markets that they hadn't traditionally been into so that's going to be fascinating to watch all right let's get into insurance and managed care here is our group of folks uh, insurance and managed care insurance of course is primarily a service sector not that much uh, into capital equipment 
And in this case, well, and once again, if you recall, the way we're approaching this is because you're going to see these names on these lists and you might say, you know, Anthem, um, not only are they an insurer, but they may actually operate some facilities. Same thing with Hignus, uh, Cigna and Humana and whatnot. In this case, our analysis is limited to uh, what their primary um, business model is in order for them to be des designated in the global 500 okay so in this case we're talking about their primary activity of the insurance portion not so much uh, anything else so in the short term they uh, a good number of them the revenues are off uh, because of uh, government driven directives to support covid based care a number of people have not been able to make the payments into um, their premiums and uh, the revenue is off and, and but uh, the issue that you've got going on is the government asked them to to uh, pay for testing and the government's asking them to minimize the cost burden on the uh, policy holders uh because of the extraordinary times written that they may get reimbursement from the federal government i don't know if they're or from the various uh national governments i don't know if this is going to be a 100 percent of cost or whatnot but the short-term outlook on a number of these is that uh, the revenues are going to be flat the revenues may decline um however a number of them have a pretty strong cash position so in this case in the short term what I'm expecting is, um, you know, they'll eventually have some resumption of elective procedures. Now that a good bit of uh, hospitals have figured out how to have COVID, non-COVID wings or designations in their facilities, in which case they can now resume elective procedures, in which case then the insurance market gets back to being what it's going to be. Uh, with regard to staff, you have uh, the supply chain that is surrounding what are the what are the what do you need to provide for people uh if they're non-virtual if they're in the office you, you know we kind of know what that looks like uh, the real estate applications the it uh, uh you know their computer needs uh everything else that goes with that if they're virtual you know what is the impact on the supply chain there in which case it's you know is there additional uh, personal protective equipment that you need to provide to folks is, are there different ergonomic requirements that you need if folks are going virtual and non-virtual are there additional support services you need to support remote versus non-remote people what are additional security concerns you need to make sure that you have controls in place to monitor for cyber security and a whole host of things um you, you you run into issues there so in the short term we think with just not being in the office um there was a decrease in demand on their supply chain to the extent that once we get into the longer term that they allow people to start coming back into the office uh what does it mean to start a, that supply chain back up for all of the requirements that they had in their office um longer term as well they're going to have to deal with aging populations and that's going to be more of a cost issue for them so uh to the extent that they can deal with that in increasing premiums they'll be able to do that but uh, they can't increase premiums too much, so they will start putting pressure on their suppliers to reduce costs, hence the cost controls. Uh, and they, you know, always have increased pressure on the supply chain for internal and external productivity improvements, meaning if they can get more productivity out of the people that are currently working for them, they get more productivity out of the assets that they currently have in place. If they can figure out how to get uh, multi-purpose uh, use of existing assets and infrastructure that can drive additional revenue they're always in the market for that so if you are providing products and services into this market i would say um uh you know unless you find a way to help them sell more policies or increase their market share uh this is going to be a, a pure cost play and to some degree it's nuanced it's not as um um, it's not as changing as a number of markets 
uh, because insurers just kind of have the ability to make money in any market. <laughs> All right. <laughs> hey, if your business model is to charge people as much money as you can, hoping they never use the service that you're providing for, then you will figure out <laughs> how, how to make money. Uh, medical facilities. All right. Once again, in their case, they lost a number of revenue from elective surgeries. People just didn't go in. So they've got to, in the short term, stabilize from COVID. And uh, and what that really means is a lot of what they would have ordered, they didn't order. They, they got quite a bit of PPE, but some of the other stuff that they needed from just having a lot of people in the hospitals and from doing other kinds of things, um, there's not as much. I mean, I, I, I hate to be um, overly graphic about this, but you know, they really aren't getting as many people coming in from car accidents and motorcycle accidents and all the other kinds of things. Cause there's just less people on the roads and there's less people doing these, these different things. So a lot of things that people used to go into medical facilities for that's been curtailed in which case, uh, in the short term, the medical facilities have to deal with the revenue stabilization, sta uh, stabilization, not so much in nursing homes, and uh, assisted living facilities um there probably been some people who have been slow to come in so they probably hadn't been able to replace a lot of that revenue just yet uh, so they probably have some similar issues here but in which case as is always um what happens in a downturn in uh revenues is there's more focus on supply-based rationalization and uh cost improvement so whether they ask for inst uh, extended terms whether they try and negotiate deals uh longer deals with less people that can uh cover them for uh at a lower cost that that will continue be to be the play here longer term they've got to deal with uh competition from specialty care providers uh, what's going to be interesting here is we're seeing a number of doctor provided facilities. We're seeing folks trying to specialize. Once again, we talked about uh, ambulatory care. We talked about urgent care. We talked about uh, doctor owned hospitals. So you start getting into all these other different types of niche players that can uh, specialize. And that looks like competition to some of the larger guys that they could just be picked off bite by bite. A number of them are getting so large that they're going to a shared services model and the implication on the supply chain there is a shared services group is looking to actually take all of the spin across the entire enterprise and try and rationalize the supply base. They're trying to figure out who's the handful of suppliers that can actually work with them on a um, uh, uh, global or national or regional basis and can they leverage that spin for a lower price and then in some cases these companies have gotten so big and so unwieldy that they are looking at outsourcing non-core activities so you might be saying you know between this one and the previous one what does that look like for you as the small business owner then you have to ask yourself um, in this case, whether or not you still have a good business case to go direct, are you offsetting enough costs and are you generating enough revenue, profitability or market share that you can go direct or to the extent that they might be consolidating spend to larger companies, what we call prime or first tier, whether or not their prime or your first tier is your target customer. That's what you'll have to decide in this space. And there's, you, you know, again, from uh, uh, social justice uh, unrest across the globe, as well as COVID-19, there is a demand for small, bus uh, small businesses as well as diverse businesses. So there is opportunity. You just have to be crystal clear on what's the value proposition. What, what, what's the business case for them using you? You get that sharp and you're going to be good to go. Pharmacy. All right. Uh, a good number of pharmacies have, uh, have had a combination of pharmacy, convenience store, um, grocery store, food store, a whole host of things. And a good number of them are having a re revenue shortfall just from the reduction in foot traffic. And so the impact on that is if 
they aren't having inventory turnover for what's on their shelves they, if they're selling less of it then they're they're buying less they're buying less from their suppliers period uh, in some cases they need extending ter extended terms so in in some cases where they may have paid in um, 10 days 30 days 60 days they may be asking some of their key suppliers you know can they uh, pay them a little later just to manage cash flow uh, and in this case you can see that there's potentially as I mentioned a moment ago a uh, they may have a redu reduced demand from their supply base because they just don't have um, inventory turnover there they, they don't have inventory velocity so uh, when they start seeing foot traffic come back and they start seeing a general uh, pickup in consumer spend and when they're not competing with uh, Amazon and they're not competing against uh, Walmart and Target and uh, a lot of the other folks then uh, they, they may actually see quite a bit more going on here. CVS Health being the largest one as a U.S. based company with over 295,000 employees. Uh, as I mentioned in the in the in a previous slide for this, you know, CVS announced the acquisition of United Healthcare. I believe it was United Healthcare. It could have been one of the others, but uh, moving into insurance, if, if that's approved, that that's going to be substantial. Uh, they probably at this point will be looking at, you know, what does the online business model look like? How do they get better at doing what Amazon does for their items? And uh, once again, mergers and acquisitions. So this could end up being a growth market, depending on what they do with M&A for the supply chain. Um, this is going to be one of those ones where you're going to have to watch this one closely to see what's going on with pharmacy and other services. Um, and we'll talk about a few other things that are a little bit more downstream of pharmacy, like medical products, manufacturing, and uh, the pharmaceutical companies themselves in order to have a clearer picture of if you are supporting the pharmacy industry, what you can expect uh, to happen to your small business. As I mentioned, medical products and equipment. Okay, this one is going to be interesting. Obviously, with the elective procedures being off, you, you, there's a potential for demand uh, shortfall uh, as well to the extent that any of what they have is tied up in the, the, the issue with China uh, and whether or not the Western uh, countries are beginning to rethink what it means to purchase from China given each country's perception of did the Chinese supply chain respond to them in their time of need that's going to affect medical products and equipment manufacturing so what you can probably expect in the short term is some reassessing of whether or not the manufacturing indeed needs to be relocated um, as part of the rethinking and if so where it may not come back to the home country but it may come back to a country that um, can do both deal with their own um, national needs as well export so um, you, you should expect to, to be on top of trying to handicap where you think that's going to occur and what the role is for your small business in uh, being ready for that because what you want to do is anticipate it be ready for it be a partner in it be a part of the change so that um, so that you're viewed as a long-term partner now, uh, overall, with an aging customer base, uh, medical products and equipment, the, the only threat to them really and truly, I mean, it's like, you know, if you need a knee replacement, if you need a hip replacement, you, different people may come in with different technologies to do that. They may come up with different types of procedures, which will have an impact on the equipment, the underlying products themselves. But in terms of the equipment, the, the hospital beds, um, the the stethoscopes you know all the various things that they need um, we got an aging customer base and there's going to be an increase in demand for these products over the long term and as I mentioned uh, product innovation is always a business risk for them and so the question there with product innovation is you know if you are manufacturing a product um, what, what are the opportunities for you in this market it continues to be a growth market and if you are supplying equipment to people, equipment or services to um, or raw materials in this case to any of these companies, what is that raw material 
and um, how much more will you need for it? And as some of these shifts occur, where where do you potentially play to support them? So uh, if you're supplying into this market, you may have some some issues short term for the demand shortfall, but long term, you're probably in pretty strong shape on this one. Pharmaceutical companies. All right. Number of different things going on here. Once again, um, for elective procedures and people just not going to the doctors for various things, there's probably globally some production volume adjustments. And in this case, they may have uh, not only some production volume adjustment issues, they may have some spikes. Um, they may deal with the spikes with regard to inventory and they may not do anything with production, but if they actually uh, affect production to meet the, the needs, then right now they had a dip because of the decrease in elective procedures, uh, but they may have a spike for COVID related needs uh, and they may have a secondary spike as we start ramping up and getting back to normal, getting back to pre-COVID when the um, uh, elective surgeries and other things are, are resumed. Uh, the new product development for COVID, uh, COVID uh, with therapeutics and vaccines, this could be with us for a while. There's some, some estimates out there that this could be with us for um, 24 to 36 months. Um, you know, who knows how long it takes to to uh, get a vaccine for six billion people, assuming everybody takes it. And not only that, um, but for the folks that don't take it or for any hiccups with the vaccine, you, um, what quantity, what volume of therapeutics would you need? And since right now, in my personal belief, we're still in the early parts of this. Who knows what the second, third, fourth, fifth generation of um, vaccines and therapeutics and other products for COVID are going to be. And of course, once again, as countries look at, do, do they need to look at this uh, nationally rather than globally uh, for pharmaceuticals? Once again, what's the, what, what do you have to do if you're going to reposition the entire supply chain to, to A, produce domestically and B, uh, distribute and if you look at the countries involved here China US Switzerland Germany France Britain there is an opportunity for all of these countries uh, to rethink what their actual supply chain needs to look like do they need to go from a mostly uh, large centralized manufacturing facility um, with a smaller satellite regional uh, manufacturing for specialty products or do they need to have a pretty broad footprint of you know a, a little bit of everything in uh, in one in, in multiple plants with swing volume ca uh, capability uh, depending on what the market needs in which case they're they're not overly dependent on any particular country nationalizing all of the supply and not exporting in the midst of an emergency so there's a lot of rethinking that's going to go on here primarily in manufacturing and if you're providing raw materials or products or services into this supply chain what's the resulting impact to you in both the short and long term because they're making these decisions right now and then of course long term uh, this isn't really being talked about right now but what I would anticipate is you know, in the process of looking for a vaccine for COVID, what were the other 10, 15, 20, 100 other things that you discovered that will be of amazing benefit? Um, and they don't solve COVID, but you actually had breakthroughs. You you had new product development. You had new new opportunities. And so I think we can expect that there's going to be a rollout of a of a revolution of different medical care options uh, especially in the pharmaceuticals area and uh, with regard to what that means to their supply chain and whatnot that this potentially could be a growth market for them for some time to come they just have to get through this period i mentioned the pricing model changes from uh, favorite nations implementation once again a good number of these companies specifically have uh, funded their research and uh, and profitability 
from uh, the wealthier countries. But when the wealthier countries say, you know, we don't have the money to fund that, that uh, it makes absolutely no sense for you to sell the exact same pill for a dollar in a developing nation and a hundred dollars or a thousand dollars in uh, a developed nation then as pharmaceutical companies begin to rationalize that whole thing and figure out what the right number is across the board or across a region they're going to have to that's going to have an impact on their supply chain typically their first first reaction in a situation like that is to go back to the to uh, their supply base and see what kind of cost concessions they can get so you you can't expect that that's going to happen but they would probably be willing to change volume, uh, exchange volume for margin for that scenario. Uh, and same thing here, manufacturing and supply chain repositioning. Um, we can start seeing that, you know, everybody that's producing in China, they may not uh, come back to Britain, France, U.S., Germany, Switzerland. Um, they may move to uh, South Korea, Vietnam, um, uh, Malaysia, the Philippines, or other places where the cost of um, the the cost of labor is not so bad, um, the existing supply lines can can still be managed. Um, so they may look at those options if they believe that they get a more favorable relationship when a crisis occurs from those countries, because those countries just don't have the same domestic need. Uh, as a country with a billion people, these countries don't have a billion people, so their domestic need just wouldn't be that great. Uh, so that would be a separate scenario there if you can get that kind of manufacturing in those locations. Uh, or those folks could bring some of it back in country. So you, you're going to have to look for that. And if you're in this market, you probably have a good feel for how this is going and where you need to position your business for the next three to five years. We also have wholesalers. And with wholesalers, the situation that we're going across with wholesalers is, uh, once again, they primarily are doing warehousing. So they are dependent upon what it is they get from the point of delivery. The point of delivery being the hospitals and doctor's offices and so forth and so on. So in this case, if they see a reduce in demand, then for them, because they are getting their products from the manufacturers, in some cases, some of them actually manufacture, but, but most of these, they are acting as a distributor, as a wholesaler. And in this case, they have to deal with inventory rebalancing because their inventory potentially is not turning over as frequently. They have to deal with transportation costs. Uh, and they may have uh, some other transportation and warehousing issues as the uh, customer's potentially move from decentralization that's that could potentially be an issue for wholesalers uh long term i think for them it's reasonably unchanged this market is going to grow with uh, hospitalization and with the aging population then uh, this this market is probably looking pretty strong here's so once again the reason we talked about this one um in this context is you know here are all of the industries we talked about, medical products and equipment, uh, med medical products, medical devices and equipment, pharmaceuticals, um, for all intents and purposes, those are manufacturers. They're manufacturing a drug or equipment. You then have your wholesalers, uh, and this is your uh, Cardinal Health and uh, all of those uh, types of people that we talked about previously. Uh, as well, you have your medical care facilities and your pharmacies, uh, in which case they, they look like a re retailer or a dispenser. This is where product and services dispense to the consumer or customer. And of course, you've got your insurance company. So in this case, if we start seeing right here where there's increased um, or reduced demand in hospital beds, doctor's office visits uh, and walking in pharmacies, then we go down this chain, there's going to be um, a smaller demand on wholesalers to um, to inventory and warehouse product form. There's going to be a reduced demand on the uh, manufacturing of medical products, equipment, devices and pharmaceuticals. 
uh, there's going to be a decrease in demand for those suppliers are going to, and there's going to be a reduction in the raw materials that they need to actually provide that this this whole chain kind of works as one single extended supply chain even though in the global 500 they have it listed uh, between these three and this four major type of supply chain activities as we've been talking about these now what you see here is in this case you know you've got warehousing shipping products and orders and e-commerce and whatnot to support everything that goes into this one you've got all these in place for everything that goes into distribution you got all this going into place that everything that actually goes to the point of delivery uh, right here and of course you've got the retailer uh, you, you've got the insurance and managed care as the uh, and insurance more more so than anything else um, in that interface between the point of delivery and actual consumption or the customer so you can kind of play with this and think through for your business depending on where you plug in or depending on which of these where you plug in uh, where do you need to focus for your small business and what's the potential implication that it's going to have um, looking for both the short term and the long term so thank you thank you thank you thank you hope you enjoyed this one hope it gave you some ideas once again the point of this entire series is as you begin to think through where you can get money now and where you can get it's like your uh where you get money now and where you get money later if you are positioning your business if you're trying to figure out what you need to do to keep your doors open if you're trying to understand what's going on with your customers or prospective customers based on COVID, we're trying to give you a framework for you to kind of think these things through and figure out where you can focus efforts both now and tomorrow on your path to building your legacy business by getting your three to five year strategic plan tight and getting your immediate revenues stabilized and going. So we will see you on session number five coming up soon. Hope you enjoyed this. Leave comments in the um, uh, here on, on the post and uh, let me know what you thought of this analysis. If you wanted me to talk a little bit more about anything else, share with the uh, fellow community members uh, the value that you got from this or some things that you might have to look at for your business um, that you think could could help out. And oh, by the way, you probably saw this. If uh, you want some help from the community for an opportunity you might be dealing with, uh, that's what the community is here for for you. So there you have it and bye for now.